It's, a, it's an amazing story that, you know, you could really drill down in a bunch of different ways. I guess at the highest level, um, we left off when you were talking about Dutch. You told Dutch about yes. the kettle. And you also realized that this prayer ethic that you felt so strongly about was not a coincidence. It was in your bloodline, yeah. really. It went back generations. Yeah. But you, yeah. didn't, you, you hadn't put too many other pieces together yet. Yeah, so, I, that, so then I knew I had this, this, this call in my life for the nation. I tell you, here's what happened to me, y'all. When I would pray for the nation at that point, it was like I was praying for my neighbor across the street. Mm -hmm. I knew the authority of my life has shifted yeah. in terms of what God was calling me to. And God gave me his heart. He gave me his heart for this nation. He gave me, gave me his heart for revival. And uh, it, uh, it, I still, still feel that, that, you know, I take that place from time to time, but that's what I've been carrying. So the, the deal is this. Um, shortly, you know, Dutch and I, we, we do that prayer gathering together. Here's what happens. So Dutch, his name is Dutch, but it was the Dutch that brought the first slaves into America. Mm -hmm. 1619. Yeah. And it was William III, which my, my, my number William III, but William III that came from England was the first king from England that sent slave ships into America. God connected Dutch and I together to say, look, I want to use your relationship to show that I want to reverse the effects of yesterday's pains. Amen. Awesome. Amen. Acts 17, 26 and 27, God said he made from one blood yeah. many nations yes. and determined the bounds of our habitations time beforehand that we may seek after God together and find him. It would be not far from every one of us. And so I'm, I'm traveling with that kettle. And then here's where, where Matt comes in. I have a dream about Martin Luther King. In the dream, God begins to deal with me about my uh, unforgiveness issue. I, I shared a dream with you. Uh, I was actually on my way to uh, Dr. King's church in Montgomery, Alabama, where the civil rights movement got started to do a reconciliation service. But that night, I had a dream about the dream of Dr. King. In the dream, Lou, Lou, Lou Engel and I are on our way to Dr. King's old church, but I couldn't get there. We couldn't get there until we first picked up Dr. King. So it's a dream. So Dr. King's alive, and we go by this house, and Dr. King comes out of the house, but he has this humongous white duffel bag with black handles on it. And in the dream, he starts emptying all this dark garbage out of that duffel bag. Then he throws the bag down violently, and he comes again to this vehicle with us. And in the dream, I thought to myself, man, that bag could make a nice souvenir. <laughs> And so it shows how carnal I am, like even in my dreams. I'm thinking, I went to more house, he went to more house, the bag and make a nice souvenir. So in the dream, I go to try to pick up the baggage, but before I could touch it, Dr. King grabs me by my shoulders and he says, No, do not go back and pick that up. And he starts telling me what I need to do to heal the race issue in America. I wake up from the dream in tears. I didn't realize I was weeping in intercession the whole night. My pillow was soaked with tears. I shared the dream with Lou. He begins to weep. And we just began to pray, God, what's the interpretation for this dream? I said, God, remind me, what did Dr. King say to me? And the Lord said to me, William, the white bag with the black handles, that would be the interpretation for your dream. And I realized, oh, my God, the black handles represented how I, as a black man, have been handling my white baggage. Mm. Wow. God was saying to me, William, get rid of your white baggage. You've been carrying it for way too long. Yeah. And so I knew what the Lord was talking about because I know what it's like when I was you know, 13 years old, myself and three other friends were at a convenience store. And as we're walking down the street, a carload full of white guys call us the N-word, said they were going to shoot and kill us. They chased us for almost two hours. They probably were just jaw riding, but we, we were terrified. I know at 19, uh, what it's like to have a police officer falsely accuse me of shoplifting when he couldn't find anything on me. He tried to provoke me into a fight. I know what it's like in my 30s to get my first nice house in the suburbs but the same police officer for the first three months, almost every week he would just pull me over for driving while black. I know what that feels like, but y'all know what I've done? For every white person, every police officer, I put those storylines in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. I saw everybody through, the, through that veil. And that's the devil's diabolical plot. It's Revelation uh, 12 where it says that the enemy is the accuser of the brethren. The word accuser is the Greek word kategoros. It's where we get the word category. So the, the diabolical plot of the enemy is to get us to categorize and stereotype each other so that before we ever have one conversation with each other, we put some veil in front of everybody. We see everybody through this faulty lens, this faulty narrative. God was saying to me, we well, get rid of your resentment, get rid of your unforgiveness, get rid of your bitterness, 
get rid of your white baggage so you can get into a new vehicle that can bring revival and justice for everybody. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's the question for everybody right now is this, what color is your baggage? Exactly. Yeah. God is saying, get rid of the church because we need each other because only a united church can heal the division in our nation right now. So uh, I shared that with Lou, it's powerful time. He said, hey, I'm having this conference. It's gonna be at uh, the Lincoln Memorial, January 17th, 2005. Bring your kettle, share this dream, share your story. Well, there was a white guy who I didn't know named Matt Lockett, who had a dream, he had a dream about Lou. <laughs> and uh, the dream was so profound. He went to see if this person, Lou Engle existed. He didn't know who Lou Engle was. He didn't know he even existed. Types his name into this newly invented thing called Google, and up pops the face of the man that he saw, Lou Engle. Wow. And he's praying for revival and the ending of abortion. He freaks out because that's, that's everything he saw in his dream. So he comes to that prayer gathering, and, 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 we, and we met, and uh, uh, we became friends. We've been friends for 16 years, uh, 10 years before we knew the rest of the story. Well, fast forward about five, six years ago. My friend, Matt Lockett, he found out that the Civil War ended in his family's front yard. It's amazing. Yeah. He finds out that the last battle of General Lee was fought at a house owned by his family. So we thought, oh, wow, cool coincidence. Here are this kettle pot where pray, slaves prayed underneath it for their freedom. And you have this house where General Lee fought his last battle. We thought, man, what a cool coincidence. Your front yard and your family's home became the answer to our forefathers' prayers. What a cool coincidence. But then, y'all, we stumbled on more research, and we learned that it was Matt's family who owned my family where that killer pot came from. That is amazing. Stumbled so, upon or uh, hand yeah. of God? Hand of God, you know. And I mean, and, but this happened to two guys who were led by dreams to the place where Dr. King said, as I have a dream speech, I have a dream that one day the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit together at the table of brotherhood. So if they can... Maybe the dream speech wasn't poetry. Maybe it was prophecy. Yeah, yeah. You know, maybe, maybe there's a dream king called the King of Kings whose father is still going to answer his prayers and he's trying to sober us up. And he's saying, Father, I pray that there be one so that your glory could come so that the world will believe. Maybe God hasn't forgotten about the prayers of Mama and Papa on them. Yeah. Under that kettle. Yeah. Under that kettle. Under that and kettle. Then, and in every single family, you know, because the thing is, the thing I learned from those abolitionists, they were, they were willing to fight for somebody that didn't look like them because they knew they were connected because of the blood of Jesus. Helped me realize, hold up, that killer pot is just not part of my family history. It's part of yours too if, it's, if you're a believer. In other words, I'm just as much a spiritual son of Jonathan Edwards yeah. and Charles Finney as you are Martin Luther King and William Seymour right. and C.H. Mason and Sammy Rodriguez. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm just speaking about some folks who are alive today, but I'm just saying we're connected by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. And when we come together, that kind of unity, that kind of agreement, something powerful happens. We can move the chain forward of revival and healing. So just to summarize, you went because of a dream, and then he went because of a dream. And the dream that he had, he said in another interview that it was on the one-year anniversary of his father's death. So exactly even there, right. there's a connection to his generational peace. And that plays into the story here because there hadn't been that that resolution that he wanted. He said it was a really troubling year after he lost yep. his dad. And now yep. he's also longing to get some closure, it seems. Uh, so now you guys are friends and you realize that there's this incredible coincidence, quote unquote, you know, stumbled mm -hmm. upon, but that's not right. the end of the story. No, nah, well, you know what happens, we, we find that out and that's, we got stuck there for like a year, year and a half. So, the, you know, it's the prayer movement. It's the prophetic movement, right? You know, you, I run with Chuck, Pierce, and Dutch, and yeah. We're in a swirl. We're in a prophetic swirl. We're like, oh, my God, this is so cool. But then after about three months, it was like, hold up. Your people are my people. Yeah. <laughs> and then it, it, it just kind of hit me. And I was like, wow, because we had stories in our family passed down also about slaves who were beat to death just for going fishing without asking. And now I'm... I'm struggling a little bit because now I have a face connected to those stories. Mm -hmm. And it's the face of somebody that I love. And now I'm trying to forget how my friend's family, whatever my family's enemy. And so I had to, I had to get rid of my baggage again. I had to go to a deeper level of forgiveness. And, uh, and for Matt, for him, he said for him, 
the whole story of slavery and the pain of a people was all like, you know, I wasn't there, you wasn't there, get over it. He said, but now he had a face connected to that and it was, it was mine. And here are we, our families love each other. We're connected to each other. We love running together. And so we had to do our own soul, soul search. And we talked about it uh, together, but then we did a lot of more soul searching on our own. But here's the thing. After a year and a half of that, Matt was in prayer one day and the Lord tells him to read a book about Methodist revivals that happened in Virginia. So he gets the book and he starts reading through it and he gets to a part where it says a guy named Daniel Lockett led one of the last revivals in Virginia. And he's like, hold up, Daniel Lockett? Because his last name Lockett. He pulled out his, his uh, you know, genealogical work that his brother had done. And there is the name, Daniel Lockett. So he had a revivalist and an abolitionist who was a circuit rider with Asbury. Wow. So not only Maybe. slave owners, but a history of the awakening. Yeah. A heap of history of the awakening in his family. So that's the thing is like in my family, because we had the folks, I got folks who gone to prison. I've done stupid stuff I'm not proud of, but thank God for the blow to Jesus, right? But then we had to have these folks back here who were contending for revival and the ending of slavery. Matt had family members who were, yeah, who were, uh, you know, slave owners, but he also had family members that fought for the ending of slavery and preached the gospel. And so, and all our families had these things called generational curses and generational blessings. They represent these dominating themes or storylines. And I think that's what God is shouting to America right now is this. What storyline do you want to be a part of? Right. The healing or the hurt? The blessing or the curse? Right. What storyline do we want to be a part of? And so uh, the last story connected to that, there was a, a man in Matt's family who, uh, who, uh, uh, had a daughter, Lucy Lockett. Lucy Lockett uh, is right at the end of slavery, and there's this mother trying to teach her son, five-year-old boy, how to read. And of course, back then, it was against the law for slaves to read and write, but during Reconstruction, it was still frowned upon because they were afraid of insurrections. And, and then also, too, they were trying to suppress uh, African-Americans altogether. But she walks in on them, and the mother's trying to teach the boy how to read, and they, they think there's going to be bad consequences. And Lucy Lockett says, no, no, no. What you're doing is good and right. I'm going to teach you. And I'm going to hire somebody to be your tutor. So she did. She hired somebody to be the tutor for that mother and that five-year-old boy. We know that story because that five-year-old boy grew up to be Robert Russell Moton. He became uh, the second president of Tuskegee Institute. Oh, wow. he, became a, he became an education advisor to four presidents. <laughs> and when the Lincoln Memorial was dedicated, Robert Russell Moton was the one who gave the dedication speech of the Lincoln Memorial. That's amazing. That's God. And, it, and then 41 years later, Dr. King would come to that same spot and do the I Have a Dream speech. Well, we call it that, but he didn't yeah. even have the I Have a Dream part in his notes that day. He so didn't. He talk didn't. about it being talking, prophetic. Yeah, I'll talk about that. And then but 41 years later, Matt and I would come and meet each other at those same steps same where Dr. Place. King said, right. I have a dream. And one day the sons of former slaves, oh, sons man. of former slaves on the Sit together at the table of brotherhood. Let me tell you a story about how that, uh, that happened, though. So Dr. King, he, uh, uh, he was in a prayer meeting at a church that had burned down by the Klan. And there's this little lady named Prathia Hall. How do you like that for her? Great name. <laughs> Great name for an intercessor, so right? Yeah. Prathia. Her daddy was a Baptist preacher, and he... You know, he wanted her to be a person of prayer, and she was. And she wanted to be a great, great, great preacher and theologian. Went to Princeton University and all that. But she's in her 20s, and they were in this rubble of a church that had been burnt down. And Prathia Hall starts praying, and she gets in this rhythmic cadence, and she starts going, I have a dream. And she just started naming off different things. And so Dr. King was in that prayer meeting. He said, hey, little lady, uh, can I borrow that? <laughs> And she said, sure. So for a year, he incorporated that phrase in his prayer meetings. Right. He prayed in his prayer meetings. And then uh, when, he, when he spoke in Detroit, uh, 1963, uh, he, he, he's, he's speaking in July there. And he starts, he hits the whole I have a dream thing. And Mahalia Jackson was there, a famous gospel singer. She was there, heard him. So August comes, he's there, getting ready to do the speech, August 28, 1963. And uh, he's getting ready to do the message. And it's his speechwriters who helped him. They said, you know, let's leave that I have a dream stuff out of it. Let's just 
focus on this, what we have written here. And so he does, he focuses on his written speech, but if you turn up the volume loud enough on some, some recordings of this, you can hear somebody say in the background, Martin, tell him about the dream. <laughs> it's Mahalia Jackson. Mahalia Jackson. He says, Martin, tell him about the dream. And he says, I, I have a dream. Y'all know the didn't deal. Didn't even pause. Yeah, no, he didn't even, didn't pause, even pause. And he just, poof. poof. But, but it was birthed out of his prayer life. Poof. That's what I'm saying, y'all. Right now, there's things gonna be that, that are going to happen. They're going to change history. They were birthed out of your prayer 